Hello and welcome to the lecture series on basic cognitive processes. I am Dr. Arg Varma from IIT Kanpur. In this course, we have been talking about various cognitive functions over the past 8 weeks. In today's lecture, I will try and summarize what we have done over the past 8 weeks. And also, I have Ranjit with me who has been the teaching assistant for this course and has been helping you out with all the queries and questions you have had and all the uh, assignments and the solutions that uh, we have had over the last 8 weeks. So, before I uh, go on to Ranjit and take some of the questions that you have sent, uh, let me try and summarize whatever we have done in this course over the past week. We will also at some point ask Ranjit to uh, share his experiences about doing cognitive science. Now, we began this course uh, in the first week uh, by talking about what uh, cognitive psychology is, why do we need to do cognitive psychology, how is cognitive psychology different from other branches of psychology. You are talking about the fact that cognitive psychology uh, per se is more concerned with the mental functions, it is not really concerned with larger uh, behavior, social attraction and those kind of things. Cognitive psychology basically focuses on explanations that are rooted in the mental functions. We have been talking about and we have seen some of the major mental functions that uh, we have that the brain uh, uh, kind of instantiates and we have been talking about mental functions like uh, perception, uh, sensation, uh, memory and attention. Now, it is interesting if you see that uh, we began our discussion with uh, first uh, situating where cognitive science, uh, cognitive psychology actually comes from. Cognitive psychology is an integral part of a larger interdisciplinary subject called cognitive science, wherein we are actually taking all of these questions which we deal with in cognitive psychology, but from an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary perspective. We began our journey in this course by talking about the brief history of where cognitive psychology actually comes from. We have discussed how did it evolve uh, with philosophy, what were the antecedents of the thought that actually led to cognitive psychology. We spend a fair amount of time talking about behaviorism and talking about what consequences behaviorism had on psychological thought in the 19th, 20th century. And we talked about the fact that uh, behaviorism at one point in time wanted psychologists to only talk about uh, things that could be measured, that could be overtly observed. But people reasoned that if you are uh, going to give any uh, explanation about behavior, if you are going to talk about or describe a human behavior in any sense, you would need to talk about the black box. The behaviorist regime probably believed that there is a stimulus and there is a black box and there is a response. We are in cognitive psychology more concerned about what the black box is, how does it function, what are its various components, how they are connected and in a sense we are going to be talking about the functional aspects of behavior. So, this is what we did in the beginning lectures in the first week when you are talking about brief history of cognitive psychology. Then we slightly moved on to more foundational assumptions on the theoretical assumptions wherein uh, you know we have situated cognitive psychology on. We talked about uh, things about uh, uh, you know David Marr's uh, levels of explanation, we talked about modularity, we talked about the uh, theoretical underpinnings on which you kind of uh, uh, you know situate the whole uh, uh, enterprise of cognitive psychology. Interestingly, and I hope you would remember that we have uh, made a sense that cognitive psychology is an exercise in the abstract. We are not really concerned with the neural underpinnings per se, because that is a neuroscientist's job. We are not really concerned with the artificial intelligence parallels. We are not really going to create machines here. But what we are going to do is to get an uh, abstract but a full description of how each of these cognitive functions are instantiated, how they are being used to uh, explain human behavior. One of the beliefs, one of the central beliefs in cognitive psychology you might have uh, seen during this course is that uh, mental functions are the core uh, explanations of all kinds of human behaviors. And if you remember, uh, even in the first uh, classes or in the introduction uh, lecture, I talked about the need of uh, atomizing behavior, the need of actually breaking down larger chunks of behavior, whatever uh, they may be, into smaller components. You would realize if you are doing this that any more complex or sophisticated form of behavior that you might want to talk about can be broken down into these atomic components. These atomic components generally turn out to be these mental functions or based or rooted in these mental functions, which some of which we have studied in this course, others we will study in the sec uh, second portion of this course. 
Now, we have been talking about issues like modularity uh, also and uh, modularity is a very interesting uh, uh, concept in cognitive psychology that was kind of uh, helps us to uh, study each of these cognitive processes slightly independently. If you remember what Jerry, Jerry Fodor said, he said that a modular system is a resistant to damage because if you have a large you know uh, uh, program and you want to study aspects of that program uh, it might be better if those programs have, if that program has been written in particular modules if you have to make a change or if there is an error or if there's a bug you can actually go and edit that particular module you do not really need to rewrite the entire program that was one of the aspects of modularity that we were stressing upon and if you see uh, how cognitive psychology or studies in cognitive psychology are structured we are in some way actually talking about these different mental functions however i hope you would have noticed that in all of these lectures which we have done and in the cognitive function that we have covered we've also made a conscious effort to show you how these cognitive functions are interconnected with each other when we began with perception we also talked about how perception is linked to attention or how perception mediates attention when we did talk about attention we also talked about how attention is connected to both perception and action and how does a mix of these three cognitive functions helps you act and interact with the world around us so those are uh, some of the theoretical standpoints we have taken in this course and i hope you would have realized that that is a very important thing to do wherein you will understand that how a particular cognitive function does not really exist in uh, isolation the concept of modularity is basically uh, uh, you know a concept for convenience to study them and also uh, say for example to understand the role of each of the cognitive functions independently in the second week we were talking about various approaches to cognitive psychology we were talking about the cognitive science approach the artificial intelligence approach we were talking about the neuroscience approach and we were uh, discussing amongst ourselves that how these different approaches basically bring out uh, you know their own unique perspectives to study the problem and the problem is basically how the mind is uh, uh, working you know uh, cognitive uh, psychology or cognitive science both of them at some point are described as studies into the mind you know what is the mind and that brings me to a very interesting uh, thing that there is this concept of mind and body and there is this a uh, great philosophical dis uh, discussion on mind body dualism uh, we have uh, specifically not really gone into that debate quite a lot uh, because that would probably be outside the scope of this course but one of the things i could say is from a perspective of a cognitive psychologist you not really uh, you know specifically worried about uh, uh, whether uh, there is a mind or whether say for example uh, how the mind is instantiated you are basically uh, you know more interested as cognitive psychologists in the functional architecture of the mind okay uh, we uh, assume that the mind might be composed of these mental functions and we are also interested in studying how these different mental functions are instantiated how are they invoked how do they lead to behavior and all of this you can assume that basically is uh, happening within uh, you know what you might want to call mind so there there, there will be a uh, interesting uh, debate uh, you know in uh, philosophy and say for example in areas of cognitive science uh, wherein you might want to take this discussion deeper and further and talk about whether uh, there is anything called mind or whether uh, the concept of mind is uh, necessary to uphold or not uh, we've also uh, in uh, some little sense talked about neuropsychology and the importance of studying disordered brains that is why we capped off uh, the uh, the lecture with the, uh, we will be capping off this entire uh, lecture series uh, by talking about disorders of attention and perception and disorders of memory uh, as in one of the later earlier lectures i was talking about it is important to study uh, the damaged brain it's important to study a particular uh, disorder of cognition because that gives us the idea of how cognitive uh, function or how our theories into these different cognitive functions uh, do a good or a bad job of explaining real life scenarios wherein we are actually seeing that the system is broken down and uh, we are actually able to see where the deficits in the brain lie and uh, where say for example you know you can help these people you can help uh, uh, come up with theories come up with uh, you know uh, rehabilitative practices that can be helped uh, you know to uh, these people uh, to live their uh, lives in a rather meaningful way now when i talk about the brain and i've already mentioned that that a cognitive psychologist is not particularly worried about the neural 
correlates of whatever cognitive functions we have been talking. But in practice, uh, a cognitive psychology, the second question you would ask after giving the functional architecture is how is this implemented in the brain? Uh, you know, so that is one of the reasons why cognitive uh, neuroscience works very closely with cognitive psychology and uh, therein what we are trying to do all the time is uh, trying to describe a functional architecture of uh, the brain uh, or the mind in terms of specific cognitive functions, but also side by side asking the question that how are these cognitive functions, uh, you know, instantiated in the brain. Say for example, you talk about memory and we have talked a lot about the uh, regions of the brain that are involved in different kinds of memory. So, once you are talking about memory, uh, it becomes slightly important, it is probably the just, uh, just the next question which you ask that, you know, which are the areas in the brain wherein, uh, you know, uh, memory is uh, stored or say for example, again, uh, is memory stored in a specific area of the brain? I hope you would know by now that it is not. Uh, but which are the areas involved in, you know, uh, creation, acquire, uh, acquire, uh, acquisition of new memories, uh, binding of those uh, new episodic memories into semantic memories and those kind of questions uh, can be asked about all the cognitive functions. We have also talked about brain areas which are uh, involved in attentional processes, brain areas that are involved in uh, perception. For example, we spend a lot of time on visual perception, we also spend some time on auditory perception. We will uh, by, uh, you know, now and then be asking these questions to ourselves. Now, uh, this is uh, what we did in the first two weeks. Uh, third week, uh, we kind of spent some time in understanding the research methodologies in cognitive psychology. I will tell you why it is important to understand the research methodology in any subject. It is important because uh, everything that I have been talking about, uh, you know, uh, as far as the cognitive functions are concerned, all of those data, all of those uh, inferences have basically been uh, coming out of particular experiments. They have, say for example, if somebody says that there is, uh, you know, three networks of attention, the alerting, orienting and inhibition networks or executive networks, uh, it has come out of, uh, you know, uh, decades of work by particular scientists who have done experiments, who have uh, shown it time and again and these experiments have been replicated across labs, wherein you can, you know, with a certain degree of confidence say that these are the uh, particular cognitive functions and these cognitive functions are basically instantiated in the brain in this particular way. Both the description of cognitive functions and the linkage of the cognitive functions to the brain have to be done uh, by following specific research methodologies. So, we talked uh, about first the basics of uh, research methods generally from a psychologist's perspective because uh, I was not really sure, uh, you know, the kind of background uh, all of you would be coming in from. Uh, but then we moved on to talking about research methods and research methodology uh, which are specific to cognitive psychology. Uh, a lot of the research methodology that cognitive psychologists use uh, typically with the help of some of the tools say for example, fMRI or EEG or PET etc. are also used in the field uh, called cognitive neuroscience where what they are doing is they are now measuring uh, the activity in the brain uh, when the brain is actually involved in these specific cognitive tasks. So, you kind of travel and make that link from demonstrating that this is the, the nature of this cognitive function. Say for example, priming occurs and then you kind of go on and tell uh, people that you know, um, I know that priming occurs, uh, but I also know that priming occurs in this part of the brain. So, my claim is rather strengthened and it is in that sense, uh, it was necessary uh, to talk about these, uh, you know, uh, behavioral uh, and uh, other kinds of experimental methodologies. Also, if you would have noticed that we have made a, a specific effort of mentioning a lot of experimental studies in the material uh, that I have presented uh, throughout, uh, you know, this course uh, on different topics, uh, be it object recognition, be it uh, aspects of memory, be it uh, aspects of attention, etc. And uh, most of these experiments basically are actually, uh, you know, uh, the information that you would like to take away, that you would like to take home with you. Uh, also, uh, I will uh, at some point I will try and mention about uh, the examination and uh, factors that are important for the examination. Uh, it is important for you to remember these experiments. It is important for you to uh, say, for example, if you are uh, putting an academic argument about something, have the idea that where, where this experiment was conducted, where is this fact coming from? More often than not, the fact is coming from a series of experiments which somebody did in a particular lab and you generally would like to quote 
that person while talking about that particular phenomena. So, also one of the reasons of covering these uh, different research methodologies was that when I am going to later talk about these different cognitive functions and facts about these different cognitive functions, I will be quoting a lot of these studies <coughs> which you would have seen uh, in the material. These studies, how they have been done, I have already explained in the research methodology section. So, after I did that, we started with again uh, sensation. Uh, we and perception, we talked a little bit about psychophysics, which is basically about measuring sensations. We also talked about the interesting method of uh, signal detection theory, wherein we talked about how, uh, you know, you can evaluate the presence or absence of a signal in a probabilistic uh, manner. So, we did both those uh, kind of things. Uh, we moved on to visual perception in the second week, wherein we uh, were examining different theoretical approaches uh, for uh, perception. We began with the uh, uh, talking about the physiology of perception, the visual apparatus that there is. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, what representation means. Now, uh, when you talk about perception, uh, and this is something very interesting, is that uh, perception is basically, uh, in some sense, the representation of the external world, uh, you know, uh, after uh, that sensory information that you gain is transduced into the currency of where the, uh, you know, how the brain communicates with each other. Say, for example, uh, uh, we talked about how the light is converted into uh, uh, neural impulses at the optic nerve or sound is converted into auditory impulses at the, uh, in the ear at the end of the, uh, in the auditory uh, uh, nerve. So, we were talking about how these, uh, you know, uh, basic uh, inputs from the environment, be it uh, vision or sight, uh, be it vision or hearing or uh, uh, taste or smell uh, are converted into neural impulses. So, we were talking about those kind of things uh, and then we uh, moved on to uh, approaches of perception. We covered three major uh, theoretical standpoints. We covered Gibson's ecological theory of perception, uh, David Marr's 2.5D theory of perception and also we talked about the constructivist and other uh, theories of perception that were there. Now, the idea uh, uh, of uh, really, uh, you know, surveying these two or three theories of perception was to actually bring to you how the different, uh, you know, uh, theoretical standpoints have viewed perception. So, uh, you uh, already probably remember that uh, Gibson said that, you know, perception is not a passive act. Perception is uh, when the individual is actively involved in interacting with the environment. Perception is for action. It does not lead to action per se. It is action. And you would have seen uh, while by the end of the discussion on perception, we talked about about perception, attention and action, uh, things uh, like wayfinding and uh, you know things like uh, uh, in, uh, interacting with objects and we talked about object recognition theories and stuff. Uh, we have found that this is a very interesting and an important approach to perception. Also, we talked about uh, approaches, uh, say for example, David Mars 2.5D uh, approach to perception, wherein uh, how does a person, you know, from the sensory input builds a 2.5 dimensional uh, uh, view of the world, 2.5 dimensional representation of the world and then converts it from this viewer centered representation to the object centered representation when you are finally constructing the three dimensional uh, view of the world. So, those things are also theoretically important. I hope you kind of gained something out of it and you could appreciate how a very simple thing that we for the most part take for granted that you know that you, that you see and you can see colors and objects in motion and uh, you know all these uh, depth and all these things almost automatically there are uh, and again that's the spirit of cognitive psychology that there are uh, these uh, uh, little little computations that need to happen these uh, you know large chain of uh, uh, rep uh, representations uh, that need to build to be built up uh, because of which you will understand so for example you uh, they are not really uh, passively seeing something, uh, whatever you, uh, you are seeing the sensory information is uh, being transduced and then that is uh, you know uh, going to the occipital areas and then to the association areas where you are connecting uh, the perceptual input to the um, memory and the knowledge that you have about the world and to the action uh, uh, possibilities like affordances and that is basically uh, something that should give you a complete, a more uh, holistic understanding of the process of perception. Now, when you talk about perception, there is too much uh, in this world to perceive, there is too much information that, uh, you know, the world presents to us and uh, uh, one has to, uh, in, in that sense, be able to select uh, and to be able to uh, unselect uh, some of this information. There is almost 
uh, all the time too many things happening around you, but you cannot focus on all of them at the same time. So, you need to either select something that is important and that is what you will engage with, be it a visual stimulus or an auditory stimulus or maybe something right just in your head which you want to, you know, you decide that I want to focus on this part at this point in time uh, and not the other parts. So, that is basically achieved by this process called attention. We have talked about attention uh, in a lot of detail. We have talked about, uh, say for example, uh, aspects of uh, selective attention, we have talked about divided attention, we have talked about uh, theories of a visual search there and we have basically seen uh, through our discussions on these uh, uh, particular topics that how is attention, uh, you know, how, what kind of a role did attention play in modulating your interaction with the world, modulating the kind of input that you are receiving in the world. Also, uh, it tells you, say for example, if you remember, uh, you know, Treesman's and uh, Broadbent's model, uh, you know, theories of attention, that uh, it is not that what you are not really actively attending is completely uh, gone. You might be processing some of this, say for example, if you talk about the attenuated uh, model of attention. Uh, so, you are talking about uh, things that you, uh, maybe you are, you are prioritizing something, so you are attending it in much more detail. Other things you might not be attending in that much detail, but you are still processing that in some sense. So, the shadowing task we were talking about, the dichotic listening uh, paradigm uh, served as a very good, uh, you know, uh, means served a very good experimental method to demonstrate that people can attend, uh, you know, or can be conscious of something, say for example, the voice change and the gender change and those kind of thing. Uh, of information in the unattended ear, of something that you are typically not uh, attending uh, per se. So, that is important, that is something, you know, that was uh, a lot of uh, discussion that we did and all of this basically led us uh, almost to the, you know, fourth and the fifth weeks uh, and then we came to the, uh, you know, final, the sixth week, wherein we have talked a uh, lot about uh, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we are uh, predominantly doing attention and then we kind of shifted our, uh, you know, uh, attention to memory uh, and uh, we have seen uh, some of the basic models of memory, say for example, the Atkinson and Schifrin model, we talked about sensory memory, short term memory and long term memory and while that was a useful model, we also talked about the working memory. Uh, which is uh, a complement to uh, the short term memory. We talked about how working memory is different from short term memory. Now, the whole uh, concept of working memory is that which basically tells us that memory is also not really a passive store. It is not really something that you know, it is not really like a shelf that you put something there and it stays there for some time before it is traveling to the long term memory. So, we talked about uh, say for example, how is working memory an active component uh, which uh, you know helps one select specific information by use of the central processes or central executive processes uh, and you know uh, allocate uh, uh, the attention that might be needed to even carry out two tasks at the same time. So, we talked about the visual spatial sketch pad, the, uh, we talked about the phonological memory, we talked about this control process, we also talked about uh, the buffer uh, at some point in time and this complete model by Alan Badley which has also undergone a variety of revisions uh, tells us that even memory in that sense cannot be considered a passive process. Uh, earlier information processing theory based models were basically uh, taking different components of memories, uh, different components of memory as aspects that were uh, rather, uh, you know, rather passive wherein information goes stays there for some time, then uh, once that time is done, it, uh, once uh, enough rehearsal is let us say received, it goes from the short, uh, sensory to short term memory and short term to long term memory. The concept of working memory, however, uh, is uh, different uh, in that sense and told us that no, it, it, it is not like that. We are actually uh, constantly engaged with this information and we are kind of making decisions of uh, uh, response selection, inhibition, etc. at this point in time. And when we came to memory, uh, we also uh, started talking about, you know, different aspects of memory, long term memory, uh, uh, say episodic uh, memory, semantic memory, we also talked about uh, what is the difference between explicit and implicit memory uh, and we learned that implicit memory is something very interesting, implicit memory uh, is uh, something which you cannot talk about. Uh, but you can uh, say for example, uh, you know, show it by performance, say for example, you will not be able to talk about how you learn to ride a cycle, uh, but you can really, you know, ride a cycle and show me that you know how to ride a cycle. Uh, we were talking about say for example,
little influences that uh, people have in life, say for people have uh, in their on their behavior things like priming, uh, things like classical conditioning. Now, classical conditioning is one of the uh, you know classic uh, learning paradigms, but uh, classical conditioning basically leads to what is called implicit memory, you know the influences, the association you would almost automatically make and you will stick to those influences for a uh, long uh, time. So, we talked about these aspects as well. Uh, we talked about the fact uh, that you know how uh, does say for example, how does one uh, understand everyday memory say for example, we were talking about autobiographical memory, what is the that is basically the memory you talk about uh, when you are thinking of memory. So, those are the kind of things uh, you know uh, we have uh, been discussing what is autobiographical memory, autobiographical memory is memory about yourself uh, and uh, how is it uh, you know easy or difficult to talk about autobiographical memory because that is typically uh, things that you would know. So, for an experimenter who wants to test uh, your autobiographical memory becomes that much more difficult. So, all in all we talked about uh, you know uh, sensory memory, short term memory, long term memory, talked about working memory, then we talked about uh, episodic and semantic memories, we talked about autobiographical memories. We also uh, spent uh, um, a large part of uh, one of the uh, more recent lectures talking about uh, the errors in memory. Now, that is a, an important aspect because we have uh, say for example, for the most part people assume that their memory is uh, you know infallible, their memory is correct and it is uh, you know uh, it is always if they have something in their memory it is uh, you know uh, correct most of the time. Uh, but if you uh, uh, and when you see the lecture uh, of uh, uh, on everyday memory and memory errors you would realize that that is a, a pretty simplified statement to make. Uh, uh, memory is uh, completely fallible, memory uh, is prone to variety of errors, source attribution errors are one of the uh, major kind of errors that uh, happen and because of the source attribution errors uh, and also errors say for example, faulty use of attention uh, when you are talking about things like weapon focus or say for example, uh, you know uh, uh, faulty use of stereotypical uh, things, uh, the misinformation effect we have talked about. Uh, one has to realize that uh, memory is a, a constructive process. Okay. Uh, whenever you are trying to pick up something uh, from long past, you are in some sense inadvertently uh, adding some of your own uh, expectations and biases in the narration. Uh, th there is a folklore which says that uh, when you start a whisper at uh, one end of the room, uh, by the time it actually uh, reaches the other end of the room, it's the information is completely changed. Now, if that is something that can happen uh, you know uh, almost uh, in the instant, uh, what would be happening of uh, things that you have you know uh, you are you have been narrating just out of your memory. So, we have we've been talking about the fact uh, of that as well. Now, after we did talk about all of these cognitive functions and their particular importances, uh, we have uh, also in the last week uh, talked about disorders, we have talked about uh, unilateral spatial neglect, we have talked about uh, we have talked about inattentional blindness, we have talked about chain detection, we have talked about blind sight, uh, we have uh, also talked about visual agnosias uh, and then we have also talked about uh, disorders of memory uh, you know uh, organic and psychogenic amnesias, we have talked about anterograde, retrograde de uh, differences, uh, we have talked about uh, amnesia that could be because of temporal lobe surgery, uh, frontal lobe lesions or say for example, that could uh, uh, you know be a result of uh, electroconvulsive therapy treatment. So, we have uh, basically also uh, gone into the space wherein one finds that there are interesting effects like synesthesia which is basically uh, an interesting uh, aspect of perception when a person can have uh, multiple sensory experiences with the same stimulus. So, hearing a letter can induce the perception of a color and that is amazing in a sense that you know you could uh, realize that how this uh, particular process is happening. We also saw in one of the studies that actually the people who are hearing this letter, the synesthetes, they actually experience uh, you know activation in the region V4 of the brain which is basically the one that experiences color. So, those are interesting things to know about, those are interesting uh, aspects to uh, know that how does this particular theory work and how does this particular theory go into uh, you know explaining and doing a good job of explaining why uh, these things are happening. Uh, blind sight was one interesting example that even though uh, because of the striate cortex damage there are uh, areas uh, of the visual field that are completely lost, but still people are being able to see uh, or say for example, uh, if not see, but people are still being able to 
locate light flashes in, in those regions. Now, there are particular theories about uh, these particular disorders, uh, but it, it is interesting in the sense to know that a lot of that explanation still remains. Uh, and that is typically what uh, the research in cognitive psychology is about. We talked about also aspects of visual agnosia, uh, wherein the sensory uh, system is completely intact, but the person does not detect. Uh, the person is not able to uh, identify the objects. We talked about unilateral spatial neglect, which is typically a disorder of attention, because the sensory processes are intact. And even uh, when you, uh, you know, uh, uh, grab the attention of the participant in the hemifield that he has been neglecting or she has been neglecting over a period of time, the participant can report seeing that. So, uh, if you remember the uh, exp experiment uh, wherein, the part, uh, when the, wherein the researchers asked the participants to describe a particular landmark uh, from one end and the other end, they could eventually uh, describe the landmarks on both sides, even on the neglected side when the end was changed. So, those are the, those were the details that uh, would help us and I hope, uh, you know, it would have kind of fascinated you how these disorders uh, manifest themselves and how the theories of perception. So, theory, say for example, if you are talking about perceptual disorders or attentional disorders or memory disorders, uh, what you have to do immediately is to, uh, you know, uh, pick up all those theories which we have studied in the earlier lectures and try and apply those theories to understand these particular disorders. That is typically the exercise one would expect uh, you to do that will be typically the takeaway that, uh, you know, uh, one would expect you uh, to really have. Uh, so, we have talked about all of these things. I think I have summarized uh, slightly broadly uh, whatever uh, we have uh, done in this in the course of this uh, uh, last 8 weeks. Uh, and before I uh, go to Ranjit and before I start talking about uh, uh, the questions that you might have uh, raised, uh, one of the things uh, uh, that is interesting uh, uh, to also point out is that you will be having your exams, objective uh, question papers uh, for uh, the exams of this. Uh, it is necessary uh, and that is something which, uh, which I would like to point out that you have gone through. Uh, not only the theories, but also the experiments, uh, wherein say for example, uh, you know, uh, different kind of facts have been illustrated. Uh, so, for the most part, if you are preparing for uh, the exam, it is necessary uh, to uh, really know the facts uh, and really know the experiments wherein those facts have come out, because that is what is your academic knowledge. You might just learn something and you have might some uh, have some facts, but unless you can corroborate that uh, by mentioning a particular uh, kind of literature, that is not really going to help a lot. So, uh, this is pretty much uh, what uh, I had to say about the course. I am hoping that you would have enjoyed the course. I am hoping that you would uh, uh, have understood something about cognitive psychology and you have uh, uh, gained some understanding of cognitive psychology. You might feel free to uh, email me personally on my ITK email address that is arkvarma at itk.ac.in. Uh, if you have any uh, queries or if you have any uh, uh, questions even later about uh, cognitive psychology, if somebody wants to pursue cognitive psychology, uh, we have already a PhD program in cognitive uh, science here. We will also be having uh, a master's program in the next year onwards. So, if you have any kind of queries or questions, you might uh, directly email me and I will be happy to uh, uh, respond to those questions. I will move to Ranjit and I will ask him some of the questions that you have raised over time and we will quite uh, quickly have a uh, small discussion on the fact and I will try and attempt to answer those questions. Ranjit. Yeah. So, the first question I am going to ask which is, uh, which is given by the students is, so how can we talk about feelings like joy, happiness and sad without uh, giving a reference to the physical entity? This was mentioned in one of the lectures and they need a bit elaboratory point on yeah. that. So, uh, this is interesting because this is pretty much one of the questions that uh, uh, was, uh, uh, you know, in vogue while we are talking about uh, the foundations of cognitive psychology. What I am saying, uh, saying at that point in time is that uh, from the cognitive psychology perspective, uh, you can con uh, be content in talking about the experience itself. Obviously, the experience is, uh, you know, in some way related to something. Say, for example, uh, you are not happy in isolation. Uh, so, you are happy with respect to a particular stimulus, you are uh, sad with respect to a particular stimulus and that is something which uh, say for example, uh, you know is, uh, of, uh, is of descriptive uh, kind. But as a cognitive psychologist, what I am interested in uh, is uh, not really what makes you happy so much, uh, but uh, how it makes you happy and what are the brain processes that are happening. Uh, which are leading you to experience these emotions. Say for example, somebody feels uh, sad 
or somebody feels happy and there is uh, you know in uh, typical cognitive psychology experiments there are uh, studies wherein people experience with people experiment with different kind of stimuli and they talk about say for example, there is this international effective uh, pictures database wherein people present happy faces and sad faces and happy images and sad images and they measure how are people reacting to that what it is uh, going on in their brain. Say for example, there could be behavioral responses uh, and it has been uh, shown in research that people respond to happy uh, faces uh, much faster than they respond to sad or disgusted faces. So, there are uh, uh, you know there is a lot of research in this, but the explanatory perspective in cognitive psychology is not really tied to the stimuli uh, that is uh, indicating uh, happiness or sadness, it is basically tied to the level at which uh, this can be understood and the level at which uh, a cognitive psychology based explanation will operate is basically how are you experiencing happiness, what is it in your brain that is leading to happiness, also the functional architecture say for example, what leads uh, uh, you know uh, to uh, what, what leads to say for example, perception of certain things uh, like happy or sad and those kind of th what are the basic uh, building blocks of uh, somebody feeling happy or sad, that is pretty much what the cognitive psychology perspective would be. So, how this will be different from the behaviorist perspective, so that they study only the stimulus and Activity so, and if you talk about the behaviorist perspective, the behaviorist perspective would be that they will not really be uh, interested that a, a pure behaviorist stance uh, will not really be interested in understanding uh, what the you know what it is to feel happy or sad. Uh, the behaviorist stance will be uh, what are the stimuli that make you happy, what are the stimuli that make you sad and then a systematic manipulation of those uh, stimuli to achieve a particular kind of way. That is pretty much the behaviorist stance. See, for example, uh, this whole concept of operant conditioning, uh, wherein uh, you learn something because on the basis of uh, uh, positive uh, rewards and you do not uh, you, uh, you know stop doing something if there are punishments associated to it. So, the behaviorist stance is typically in uh, giving a stimulus and achieving a behavior, while the cognitive stance is somewhere in the middle. So, after you have seen the stimulus uh, and before you do a behavior, what is it happening uh, with you uh, in terms of uh, you know what is all, uh, what uh, all is going on in your mind in the mental processes also uh, what kind of uh, you know uh, reactions are going on in your brain. So, this is basically the difference between the behaviorist uh, view of uh, let us say things like uh, emotions and things like uh, say for example, uh, you know uh, the, be uh, the behaviorist part. Uh, by the way, emotions uh, as a topic will be covered in the second uh, version of this course, which will be offered in January uh, with the title Introduction to Cognitive uh, Pro uh, Psychology Advanced Cognitive Process. There is, uh, there, that is where I will be talking about emotions in much more detail. In line with the same question, one, one of the students has quoted John B. Watson. Mm -hmm. I do not know what context he has referred. Mm -hmm. So, I mean the question is we are studying with stimulus and response, mm -hmm. it is the kind of objectifying the study of mind. Mm -hmm. I know th that is what our course is, but this is a question whether they raised, whether we can uh, uh, objectify the mind. Now, that, that is one of the things, see that is uh, where if you will uh, listen to the lectures uh, you know uh, that we have uh, done say for example, in the uh, foundations of cognitive psychology section, uh, that is what I have tried to impress that uh, the whole uh, point of behaviorism say for example, you know logical behaviorism per se uh, says that you should not talk about anything that is unobservable in behavior. So, the whole point uh, here is that you know. Uh, uh, you know the whole point of objectifying say for example, uh, Watson's uh, stance on uh, particular mental functions was uh, could be uh, so deterministic that it would say that say for example, uh, if you can predict uh, you know if you can predict uh, human behavior as per a set of uh, laws, uh, then you can actually you know predict uh, human behavior in terms of uh, you know as any physical function uh, as any physical or uh, you know chemical reaction would be. Uh, but the uh, thing is that uh, now coming to the object uh, objective of the mind, uh, the point is that cognitive psychology is not really concerned with objectifying the mind per se. Okay. Uh, there, is, uh, there is an argument to that as, uh, aspect and I will touch it uh, very soon, but the whole point is that we are not really concerned with uh, the stimuli uh, and the reaction, we are concerned with what is going on in the head. Now, what is going on in the head is happening in an abstract space. When you understand mind and you understand uh, you know uh, body, you have this idea that ma mind is an abstract space. Now, how is that abstract space 
instantiated. You cannot by virtue of giving a stimulus A, stimulus B or stimulus C and getting reactions A, B and uh, you know uh, D, E and F uh, talk about what is going on in the mind. So, in that sense you cannot objectify the mind, it is not really going to be working uh, with physical laws per se. So, what you will be doing uh, uh, now coming to the objectification of the mind is uh, one of the theories that come uh, comes after say for example, things like reductionism and eliminative materialism. So, if you can if you are going uh, in, in that line uh, then say for example, I think Patricia Churchland uh, mentions that uh, if you have completely understood uh, how each of the mental functions is instantiated by neural communication, if you have completely understood how the brain is built up, how each of the neurons are connected to each other and how the activity in these sets of neurons leads to particular mental functions, uh, then you might not need uh, uh, you know that uh, uh, that uh, whole concept of mind per se, then you uh, do not really need the mind as a construct, you can uh, you know start talking about the brain and continue uh, saying that this is the brain which is doing this and not the mind. That is basically uh, that will probably be the you know utmost uh, objectification of the mind when somebody when we are uh, in the field uh, able to understand the complete functioning of the brain. Uh, just to tell you that we are, we are too far away from that, we, we are kind of uh, in the process of understanding the function of the brain, in the process of understanding how the function of the brain can instantiate the mind, uh, but there are huge gaps and uh, I think it will take uh, us uh, quite a long time to make this connection and to uh, achieve you know a successful uh, let us say objectification of the mind. So, in my opinion we are studying the mechanisms which is underlying. Exactly. And these mechanisms we can implement with you know with artificial system, exactly. automatic robotics. So, actually the science for us if we try to objectify or if you really study the mechanisms underlying the process. I mean we cannot even objectify the whole mind per se. Yeah. The question may be the person did refer in what context Watson mm -hmm. referred to it, so that we cannot conclusively say whether he told that objectifying mind is wrong or right. This is the question posted to the Okay. Forum, so See objectifying yeah. mind again it is not uh, it is not really a value yeah, judgment, yeah. it is basically about whether you can do it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, my answer was probably rooted uh, in okay. that sense okay. that maybe uh, you can objectify the mind at some point in time. Uh, but if you remember the last uh, slide of uh, the foundations lecture, I said even if you can objectify the mind mm -hmm. per se, even if you can say that you know whatever mind yeah. is, uh, it is just neural activity and now we understand the complete brain. But the the fact is as cognitive psychologists we are still interested in something that is abstract the functional architectures say for example take an example of a machine uh, take an example of the computer per se you know all the hardware you know how each of the you know components of the motherboard are assembled and all of so you know the hardware in it all its detail but uh, it's uh, say for example uh, you don't really uh, you know talk about the software uh, always by talking about the hardware say for example you you say that i've typed something you do not really say that you know i've pressed this particular key which has given this particular signal and it has uh, reached uh, you know uh, that is how this uh, symbol p is appearing on my page so the whole point is that as cognitive psychologists we are really concerned in the functional part so much uh, not really so much in the objectification or the this hardware components and this gives me the other question which mm -hmm. is asked, the classical question which we studied in philosophy uh -huh. of mind. Mm -hmm. Maybe this course is not a point, but the mm -hmm. question arises this mind body interaction. Yeah. Whether so, the again the classic case of mind body interaction could be something very uh, similar to uh, you know uh, uh, or probably a closest answer could be given uh, from both philosophy, uh, but again I was I will mention Patricia, Ch Patricia Churchland about this whole concept of reductionism or uh, eliminative materialism is the fact is the uh, closest instance of mind body interaction one could get is basically through the brain. Uh, and how the various uh, uh, actions uh, you know neurochemical uh, uh, electrical uh, actions that are electrochemical uh, reactions that are going on in the brain are instantiating the mind. Uh, there are theories say for example, uh, there is a, there was a book uh, by Roger Penrose and I uh, sometimes mention it wherein say for example, there are now uh, fields like quantum neuroscience mm -hmm. and uh, wherein say for example, people are trying to understand even things like consciousness uh, from a slightly physical perspective, uh, uh, perspective wherein say for example, the action of the uh, you know uh, uh, neurons uh, is leading to uh, consciousness in in a rather physical uh, sort of a way. So, in in that sense, 
uh, there is uh, obviously uh, mind body interaction but is the, is that uh, necessarily a dualist thing is uh, something uh, you know uh, i would reserve my opinions on and say for example uh, there there has been a lot of discussion on this in uh, classical philosophy in modern philosophy as well even philosophy of mind even well. philosophy of mind so uh, if somebody is interested in these kind of questions i think uh, philosophy of mind and uh, uh, you know uh, there are a lot of books in philosophy of mind if you kind of uh, uh, explore that people like david chalmers and uh, Uh, others have written about uh, it a lot and those those could be the material that you would read and uh, wherein you will get uh, uh, i don't know whether answers but you will get uh, some information about these kind of questions there you can broaden the perspective this exactly is a long standing question exactly so, so one of the things uh, about this course uh, and uh, we uh, sometimes yeah. discuss it uh, is that this whole concept of cognitive science where does cognitive science as a field comes in Uh, cognitive science is basically you know all of these questions that you're asking uh, as a cognitive psychologist uh, primarily uh, a lot of these questions probably uh, don't fall in the purview of cognitive psychology or let us say do not have uh, clear answers in cognitive psychology do they have clear answers in neuroscience do they have clear answers in philosophy or computer science for that matter is also uh, debatable so what happens is uh, a field like cognitive science uh, that is basically an interdisciplinary thing uh, attempts uh, to look at these questions from all of these various perspectives and tries to uh, arrive at uh, close answers uh, it's not really uh, uh, you know uh, again uh, the solutions are not there yet but uh, things like cognitive science uh, uh, are uh, rather helpful in uh, elaborating the fact or in illustrating that these are multidisciplinary questions and are not questions that might ever be answered within uh, one of these disciplines itself I know the concept of interdisciplinary huh. is we pick the e exactly. knowledge from whatever the discipline offers. John exactly. So the know. concept is, uh, yeah. as you already know, uh, is that you pick up all the unsolved questions from these various yeah. fields and you try to look at it. Yeah. Uh, try to take the say, for example, even in cognitive uh, psychology, we've been talking about that we ha we are taking the help of cognitive neuroscience all the time. Cognitive neuroscience is taking the help of cognitive psychology by following the same kind of paradigms all the time. Uh, you uh, put in uh, some philosophical questions, or say, for example, if you are uh, somebody who likes to do computational modeling yeah. so in computational modeling you're basically using principles in uh, you know uh, parallel computation and you're using uh, computational models to understand uh, how the process of uh, uh, cognition or a particular mental function works there is a lot of work going on in uh, Uh, computer vision there is a lot of work going on say for example in uh, developing models of uh, human decision making process there is a lot of work going on say for example in creating models of specific cognitive functions models of memory models of attention models of uh, reading words all of those things are basically efforts in you know trying to solve this problem i would not even say solve but understand this problem uh, in uh, you know from this this different perspectives yeah, and this leads to other question This person is from UX background, mm -hmm. even UX background. Mm -hmm. So, how this course will benefit from him, from his point of view? Yeah. So, uh, how would this course uh, benefit somebody from, let us say, user interface uh, design kind of a background? Now, one of the things is. Uh, whenever you are talking about a particular user whenever you are talking about designing a particular product that is going to be used by your uh, by uh, human uh, users human clients uh, one of the things is uh, it will certainly help to understand how the person uh, you know uh, uh, thinks or how the person's mental processes operate say for example uh, i could give an example of uh, one of my seniors who is working uh, in uh, iit uh, hyderabad and uh, at that point in time i think they were working on a project by a software company who had uh, commissioned them to design their web pages mm -hmm. uh, and you know uh, one of the things that uh, those uh, people would want to do is that see where in uh, you know which are the areas of the web page where the users are looking in mm -hmm. okay uh, which areas if you place say for example if you're placing the home button <coughs> where should you place the home button uh, wherein the user finds it, uh, it more most convenient to use so i think uh, i mean to reduce the cognitive load which is exactly to give a so good user experience we always e try e to make it easy for the user to you know to to do the task exactly so what you would want to measure here is how is the user interacting with my product be it a web page be it a particular uh, you know a utility device or something and what are the factors that you can use to uh, you know measure this comfort uh, you know measure the uh, user experience see for example i if i remember correctly what they were doing was they were using an eye tracker to actually scan uh, you know the page uh, as to where the user was looking at any point in time 
and how this uh, you know looking at these different aspects of the page uh, you know and the difference say for example if the home uh, home button is at the top li uh, right corner or the top left corner uh, there were ways to measure uh, which is more difficult or easy for the user so these kind of feedbacks are taken by uh, user design uh, user interface design companies uh, all the time in designing these variety of products say for example even if you want to design a dashboard of a particular car you know how would you uh, place uh, there is a basic architecture that is going to be the same but how would you place uh, say for example other kinds of buttons other kinds of functionalities which the user will find uh, you know easier to uh, uh, deal with so for all these uh, theories of attention for all of know, these yeah, yeah exactly which are such you know over cover time moment exactly where they're paying attention so you can use the knowledge, yeah, uh, knowledge you know that we shared attention. in this particular course yeah. say for example uh, theories of attention yeah. theories of perception how eye movements yeah. uh, scan the particular place and all of these will help you understand acha if you are giving a visual mo, uh, you know visual modality uh, thing yeah. how is it going to help the person uh, you know understand a particular thing so, yeah. so this is the end of the question okay so if if you uh, if you reach the end of the questions i'll invite uh, ranjit to talk about his experience ranjit has done his masters in cognitive science from uh, cbcs alabad he's uh, now a project uh, staff in my, one of the projects i'm involved in so i'll just try uh, and uh, ask him to uh, explain his experience about doing cognitive science in the past uh, three or four years that he's been involved in. So I completed my undergraduation in electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. So in, in that I had a course on artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So at that time I was intrigued by the term it's called that they say these are all biologically inspired algorithm mm -hmm. when they talk about some you know algorithm and artificial mm -hmm. So at that time I was intrigued by the question what is biologically inspired algorithm. But I was, I thought my background will be, uh, you know, constrained to pursue something called neuroscience or at that time even I am not aware about there is a course called cognitive science. Mm -hmm. And then later I pursued my fellowship in IIT Madras and from there I came to know there is an interdisciplinary field which addresses all the questions of, you know, mind, brain, mm -hmm. which I was intrigued before. So this is a way that led me to pursue cognitive, co cognitive science. And later how it helped me to enhance know my own knowledge level before cognitive science and after cognitive science I can you know think of a complete mm -hmm. shift in my how I thought mm -hmm. about disciplines so we had a compartmentalized knowledge which we had discussed even mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. interdisciplinary multidisciplinary mm -hmm. so these concepts are not aware to me before I thought engineering is separate science is separate arts is separate mm -hmm. so when I study cognitive science this is like to address my own question I pick up knowledge from whatever discipline from linguistics you know, from philosophy, from artificial engineering, from new neuroscience. So this will give a different perspective of, you know, to tackling how your own questions, how this multiple discipline will help mm -hmm. you to address your own question. Mm -hmm. So my mental block of compartmentalizing knowledge, something as engineering, something as science, something as arts. Mm -hmm. So this is shattered in the beginning, when I started studying cognitive mm -hmm. science. Mm -hmm. So what is what was that that made you particularly curious about uh, let us say human behavior or uh, the human brain and uh, did you get any answers uh, while you were doing cognitive science and you are still uh, doing your research yeah, yeah. Uh, how does that uh, uh, you know help or how does that pan out? So I actually when people chart cognitive science they come with a fascination okay we are going to you know predict human behavior or how the mind operates or I can able to detect how people are thinking like a typical stereotype which we make mm -hmm. for you know psychology, psychology like people can yeah. read mind and yeah, yeah people can st study mind mm -hmm. so I also had the same thought mm -hmm. so when it's after pursuing while mm -hmm. pursuing the study it is like a complete drastic difference in you know that we can't do this mm -hmm. so this is so there are more questions before coming so now mm -hmm. it is questions are increased okay so actually that's it okay yeah so uh uh, okay, so uh, we'll try and come to the end of this uh, now, and uh, I hope uh, I'll thank Ranjit uh, for his inputs and for his help uh, uh, with the course and uh, whatever qu queries you had, he uh, uh, helped answered them, helped them, and he used to talk to me that these are the questions that people are asking, and I was trying to also uh, help him uh, through this thing, and he was the main person who was communicating uh, with you uh, through the emails and everything through the assignment solutions and those kind of things, and uh, so I'll thank Ranjit uh, for his help for the course, and I hope that. You had a good experience uh, participating in the course. I hope uh, a lot of you uh, uh, will be uh, participating.
in the exams and you will take away uh, something uh, from the course that will uh, uh, increase your interest in cognitive psychology and say for example, uh, you know a broader field like cognitive uh, science per se. And there is a small announcement before making. Mm -hmm. So, we have a Skype talk yeah. on, yeah, can you make that? So, uh, if uh, today I am kind of just uh, taking questions which you have already sent, uh, but there will be a Skype session that I would uh, be hosting on uh, 18th of September at 7 pm, uh, which is basically wherein I will be uh, having a Skype session and all of you can participate in that and uh, send in your questions live and we can have some of the discussions like we had today uh, directly with you at that point in time. Thank you. Thank you.